So, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Chris Lindquist. I'm the library director here at the Northboro Free Library. Um, we're thrilled to have you and a great turnout. I think you probably just wanted to uh, get into a nice cool place today. It's supposed to be 100 degrees. So, um, we are here, uh, first of all, I just wanted to mention a few things that are happening that are somewhat related that may be of interest to you. Uh, we have been doing uh, a memory cafe for the past year, and we celebrated our one year anniversary in April. It's called the Apple Memory Cafe, and it's all due to one person, and she's standing over here, she's very modest, uh, but Carol D. Rienzo is the force and the energy behind the Apple Memory Cafe. She's gone out and she's gotten sponsors, and we're very, very fortunate to be able to provide that kind of service here at the library. Um, and so, and when is that happening, Carol? Can you remind us? It'll be first Monday, second Monday of the month. The second the second Monday of the month at 12.30 p.m. in this room, and there's food and entertainment and crafts for those who have dementia, cognitive issues, as well as their caregivers. So I hope uh, if, if you need that type of service, if you know anyone who does, please uh, tell them about the Apple Memory Cafe. We are also now doing outreach services through a grant from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. We got a two-year grant, and it's called Library on the Go. So again, those who are at home, they're homebound, they're either permanently or temporarily disabled, they can't get to the library, we bring the library to them. So it's an outreach service, we have volunteer delivery drivers, and they bring all library materials and services to people who can't get to the library. Again, some of them are elderly, you don't have to be elderly, you could be 30 years old and you just had your knee replaced, God forbid, and you're home uh, and you can't get to the library. But we have um, that service going on through October of 2019. Then we're going to be going out to the community and asking people like Arthur here to, to sponsor and support it. So I just wanted to welcome you, and now I'm going to turn it over to Arthur. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you all for coming. And with me is my, my good friend, Christine Alessandro, who's going to be speaking a little bit later in the program. You met her before. Christine is the, the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Thank I, don't you. Want, I don't want to make you keep standing. I don't want to make Christine keep standing. Um, so you will recall um, from uh, the last presentation, well, and once again, so if you don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There were about 70 of us. Uh, there were about 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro and 10 in Boston. So we all get to do what we like because there are so many of us doing things and I get to do elder law because that's what I really like. Uh, and, and last time you met, my good friends Frank and Mary, um, they have three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. In the last presentation, they were younger. In this presentation, they were a little older. They're 80 years old. Uh, and once again, the, the point or the goal of, of Frank and Mary is very simple. They have their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. They have, a, they have not tremendous assets, but they did okay. They have a house that's worth 400000 They have a joint bank account. Frank's IRA is worth about two fifty. Frank's annuity, where Mary is the beneficiary, is worth about two hundred. So they have total assets of nine hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'm not asking you to remember all these numbers. I'm just going to bring this slide back later on when we talk about eligibility for things, because <clears throat> we spent quite a bit of time uh, last time trying to trying to explain to you how the services that are available to Frank and Mary and to all of you when you're still feeling good. And many of those services are services that are provided through Bay Path Elder Services. Bay Path Elder Services is one of the 26, there used to be 27, but now 26, um, um, ASAPs, Aging Services Access Points, who all have a, share a, have a different region around the Commonwealth. They cover the entire Commonwealth. They are the filter through which all of the federal and state money for seniors comes. So if it's, if it's Meals on Wheels, if it's work with Mass Health, if it's anything, they're involved in it. So when, when folks sometimes th th think about Bay Path or talk about Bay Path as if it is only for poor people or only for people who are really sick, that's not the case. One of the first things you want to do if you, once you become a senior is to get to know Bay Path, call them and just find out what they do. So we talked a lot about what they do for folks who are still healthy. But what about if Mary is not feeling so great? Uh, what about if she has you know, physical issues or she has cognitive issues? She has some memory loss. And by the way, you know, it's great that Carol DiRienzo is here who has been 
really the driving force behind the Memory Cafe here in Northborough. There are one of the first Memory Cafe in Massachusetts was, de was actually developed by a woman in, um, who lives in, uh, lives in Northborough, Tammy Pozzaricchi, and it was over in, in Marlborough. But there are now about 80 of them in Massachusetts. And the idea behind them uh, is that if you've got some memory problems, um, and, and, or you're the, caring for somebody who's got some memory problems, and you find yourself being in the house a lot, because that's where you're kind of spending all, most of your time, and you want to go to a place where the person with memory problems can just feel safe and comfortable, and you know you're not going to be embarrassed, and it's just a friendly atmosphere for a couple hours. And this one's local, although there is a website that has a list of the memory cafes that are in the area. There are a lot of them now. That's the point of this, that typically there is some music, there, is some other, there are some other things that happen, but it's basically about socializing among the caregivers as well as the folks who have some memory loss. So it's just a really important service. So if you're Mary and you've got some memory loss or other issues, but you want to stay at home, remember you just kind of, you want to stay at home, well, there are a couple of things that Mary needs to be thinking about and that Frank needs to be thinking about. One is, how do you fix up the home? How do you make the home safe? Safe, right? Because the standard issue home that, you know, you're walking up and down the stairs and there's scatter rugs and there's not that much lighting at night and so if you go to go to the bathroom, there's a good chance you could fall down and there are all of these things about the home that may not do you really well if there's somebody living in that home who has real memory loss issues. But I guess when I ask people to think about that, it's like, it's like beyond the, the, little, you know, the, the little ramps in the front of the house, right? It's really about thinking about the house as, as a whole, really looking room to room, figuring out what kinds of things you want. Because for example, one of the things that I learned was that, that now there are stoves that shut off automatically or that shut off if there's extra heat and, there are, and you want to look for refrigerators that you don't have to lift up, go up for, that you're only going down for. There are all these things that are available for you. And by the way, so this is an ad, if, there, if you want to talk to somebody about that, <laughs> you want to talk to her, Carol DiRienzo. That is actually her day job. She and her husband, they actually look at houses and help you figure out what kinds of adaptations you might want to use. And then if you want it, you know, and you want them to help you do them, well then they'll help you do them. But basically, it, that, that, the goal is to really tr try to provide those kinds of services, and she's local. And by the way, she's not, and because she's local, you would think, well, I mean, there must be one in every town. Well, there's no, I don't know of another one person who really focuses on that for a number of miles around. So that's first, you want to think about that. And then, of course, you have to figure out how to fund that repair, because Frank and Mary had some, they own their home, you know, and it's mortgage free, and they have some savings, but they're 80, and you know, 80 used to be, you're pretty much dead. Now, 80 is, you know, there's a lot of time left, so you want to not run out of money before you die. And so, if you're, if they're in that situ if you're in that situation, obviously, once again, your savings, you can always use your savings, that's what they're there for. Um, you can also use a reverse mortgage. I talked about reverse mortgages, you know, last time, and I'm going to mention it again. A reverse mortgage is nothing but a home equity loan on which you don't have to make the monthly payments. You go to the bank, they agree to give you a line of credit. If you haven't used the money, you don't pay anything on it. When you use the money, you start earning interest, you start paying interest, except you don't have to make the payments every month if you don't want to. Uh, and if you don't make the payments, it simply gets added to the amount of principal that you owe, and so the following month you owe a little bit more. But it's a really, I talked about it a lot last time, it's a really important tool, especially if you're 80. You know, less so if you're 65, because you've got a lot of, a lot of uh, living left to do, but if you're 80, and once again, your goal is to stay in your house, and, and this is if you need the money or if you're just worried about it. You know, the older we get, I find it myself, you're just worried. You know, and the goal in life becomes to get a good night's sleep because you wake up two in the morning, you can't get to sleep, and you're worried about stuff, and a lot of times that's it. Am I going to run out of money? Am I going to run out of money? So to know that you have a line of credit that's available, that's not costing you anything unless you use it, may be handy for some folks. Finally, there is a program called the Home Modification Program. Uh, it is a federally funded program that is, that is available throughout the state, and here's how it works. <clears throat> If you want to do a home modification, 
um, and you want to borrow between $1,000 and $50,000, um, and you go through one of the sources around, and, and the, once again, like with the, the ASAPs, the state is divided into regions, each region is covered by one source, and I'll give you that information. Then they will lend you up to $50,000, 0% interest, 0% interest. Um, <clears throat> like the reverse mortgage or the home improvement loan, it is, the, the, or the, 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 it is due if you sell the house. Also, you need to stay in your home. If you, if, you sell, if you start renting out the house, you have to pay it back. But otherwise, it's only due when you die. So it's like a reverse mortgage that the Commonwealth is giving you um, <clears throat> for up to $50,000. There is no asset requirement. There is no kind of maximum amount of assets that if you're over that number, then you, know, you can't qualify. So Frank and Mary, in this case, could qualify. There is an income requirement. So if you're a family of two, you can't have an income yearly of more than $172,500. Now, I work with a lot of seniors. That's a big number, right, from the people that I've worked with. So, I th safe to say, probably about everybody in this room could use this if you decide that you want to use it. So it's zero percent, and by the way, these don't have to be first mortgages. They can be second mortgages. I know because I've had clients who've used these, used, used these. So it can be, you know, if you can have a line of credit loan or you can have a first mortgage and still get one of these. Um, and it's not due until you die. And that's the entity. That is the, the name of the entity in central Massachusetts, RCAP Solutions, Financial Services. I know it sounds like one of these slick financial type guys, but they are the contracting entity with the state. So this money is available to you. Uh, so one piece of this, if Mary's got issues, is fixing the house. The other piece is trying to figure out how to help Mary. Your first <laughs> phone call in terms of trying to figure out that is Bay Path Elder Services. Now, and Bay Path Elder Services has a, has a kind of a large territory. As we talked about last time, there are 26 towns. They have a number of programs, and I want to have Christine talk to you about that kind of array of programs that they have, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about eligibility. Christine? All right, thank you, Arthur. Remember? Well, wait a minute, this is our high tech test. Yes. That's forward, okay. that's backward. Yeah, okay. Everything else, I don't know. Okay. All right? All right. So you... <laughs> Great. Well, it's great to see everybody again, and Arthur, thank you for having me. One thing that I always say about Bay Path Elder Services don't wait until you've got a crisis. That's really important. And here I am, an elder care professional, standing in front of you, and I'm going to tell you that was the biggest mistake I made with my mother because she lives in another state, and when she had an emergency, I was totally lost, had no clue what to do. So for me, it was a lesson learned. But say you go to the hospital, and you've got a very serious injury or illness that you may not be able to go home right away, or you may need to go home with some assistance. What are you going to do? Who are you going to turn to? Oftentimes, the discharge planners at the hospitals are very busy. If you call Bay Path, we can give you what is called an options counselor. We have two, Sue and Courtney. They will come to you, whether you're entering a nursing home or residing in a nursing home, to talk to you about what your options can be in the community to stay in the community. It doesn't have to be that you go from hospital to rehab to home. And actually, many physicians are getting away from the, that practice, and they're starting to send people home a little bit quicker. But there's no only one way anymore. There's a lot of different ways to do things. So options counseling is for people over the age of 60 or under age of 60, and it's for family members and caregivers. So if you need someone to come to see you and talk to you about what are my options? What is out there? Because there is a lot out there. Call Bay Path, and we can send an options counselor to you, talk to you. Do you charge for that? There is no charge for options counseling. Absolutely none. Thank you. And you would love Sue Cody because she's the most smiliest person that you ever met. She is always smiling. That girl is so up. She's wonderful. She'll get you through anything. So say you need some assistance in your home. You want to stay in your home. Well, what can you do? A lot of things you can do. You can private pay for services. You can call Bay Path, and we can also provide services in the home. Used to be with the state home care program, there was an income eligibility cap. 
So you could only make up to a certain amount of money for you or you and your spouse. That income eligibility has gone away. So anyone of any income would be eligible for services. You also need to be over 60 and you need to have a number of function, what are called functional impairments, which is assistance with cooking, grocery shopping, laundry, getting around outside, transportation, bathing, dressing, any of those will count, but you need six of those. So in our state home care program, there are three levels of care. The first is called home care basic. And in home care basic, you could be eligible for between two and three hours of homemaking a week. So you need someone to do a little light house cleaning, you need someone to do your laundry, maybe go get your groceries for you. This would be the appropriate program for you. And it may be just temporary. You might just need help for maybe six weeks, two months, three months while you get over that illness or fracture, especially if you don't have someone around to help you. So there's home care basic, and then there are two programs that are for folks who have more impairments and are very frail. Those two are called the Enhanced Community Options Program, which we call ECOP, and the Choices Program, and these are both for people who are frail. The ECOP program is, folk, is for folks who are not on Medicaid, non-Medicaid. Choices is for people who are on Medicaid. With the ECOP program, we can probably put in about six, eight hours of assistance a week, whether it be personal care, homemaking, uh, adult day health programs. We can get you a lot of assistance to help you stay home. In the Choices program, because it is, me is Medicaid funded, we can provide services 24-7. Now I say that with a little disclaimer because there is an issue in the state of Massachusetts and that is not having enough people to provide that care. We don't have enough homemakers, certified nurses aides, home health aides, personal care workers. But that's a problem the state is working on. But we can theoretically provide 24-7 care, you do need to have a caregiver, you do need to have a backup plan. And this is where I say you don't automatically have to go to a nursing home. There are considerations for staying home and having that care in your home under the state home care program. Now with state home care, how much does it cost? If you are below the income limits for the state, which in 2018, For a couple, if you are below $39,104 of annual income, your monthly co-payment would be $152. That's a month. So if you're get, getting three hours of homemaking on the open market, that could cost you maybe $120, $140 for that three hours of homemaking. Multiply that by four. And you can see $152 is a lot less than that 400 and some dollars you would be paying. If you are over the income limit, your payment will be calculated on a percentage of your services up to 100%. But what you are also getting with any services is you are also getting case management. You're having that individual come into your home, talk to you, see what you need, determine what your preferences are and how you would like your service plan to be set up. So you don't have to do that work, we do the work. You're not calling around to the agencies, we are doing that work for you. So I think it's a pretty good deal. So if you want to go on choices and you want to be on the frail elder waiver, this is for folks who are very clinically complex and Arthur wanted to make sure I absolutely talked about the frail elder waiver because many people do, do not know about this. Yes, you have to be on Medicaid, but even if you are not on Medicaid, if you talk to an elder law attorney, like Arthur, there are ways that you may be able to become income eligible. For example, you could do what is called a spend down, and there are other things that Arthur can talk to folks about. Some of these are trusts that can get you on Medicaid because your income would be protected. So 
If you're not on Medicaid, do not despair. You need to speak with an elder law attorney. But for the frail elder waiver, for very frail people, you must be what is called clinically and financially el eligible. To be clinically eligible means you have to qualify for a nursing home. That's with the Choices program. The Choices is a frail elder waiver. ECOP is, a, is not a waiver, but you need to be clinically eligible. So to be clinically eligible, generally you need at least assistance with three activities of daily living. And to be financially eligible for frail elder, your income must be less than 2205 a month and countable assets are less than $2,000. There are various types of mass health. The most common one is mass health standard and that's mass health that you must be on. For Medicaid, Medicaid looks at your assets. The, the home care program will not look at your assets. We do not count them at all. We only look at income. Mass health looks at your countable assets. If you're married, the outset limit of the spouse is $120,800. So there is a way within the waiver to do what is called waiving the income of the person who needs the care and then just looking at the income of the spouse. And the assets of the spouse have to be less than $120,800. The home, if it is owner-occupied, owner is considered exempt up to a value of approximately $840,000, so they will look at it. This is a great way to get care in the home. It's by no means the only way to have care. There are other options. Medicaid has a program called the Personal Care Attendant Program. That is where you, as the consumer, have the right to hire, train, and terminate a worker of your choosing. It could be your grandson, it could be your granddaughter, it could be your next door neighbor, it could be anyone that you choose. <clears throat> Medicaid will pay that person to provide care to you. Again, you need to be clinically eligible, you need to have certain level of impairments, and we have a nurse and occupational therapist come out to do an assessment of that individual. But if you're not really not fond of having people from an agency or there may be cultural barriers attached to that, having a PCA, a personal care attendant, is a fabulous option. You get the person that you want, you train them how you want your care done. There's also another program called PACE, Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. The PACE program was started many years ago out in San Francisco and has migrated to the East Coast. You may have heard of Summit Elder Care, that's in, out of Worcester. That is a PACE program. And what a PACE program does, it provides that all-inclusive care. Generally, participants in a PACE program go to an adult day health setting five days a week where there are doctors, there are nurses, there are therapists there who are able to keep tabs on what your care is, how you're feeling. So you're seeing these professionals every day. You do not have to be on Fallon, as I understand it, to be enrolled in the PACE program. But I think it's an excellent way, especially if you're frailer, to get really good care from one comprehensive team. Another option is the Adult Family Care Program, AFC program. That is where an elderly person or a person with disabilities goes to live with a host family. That host family provides the care and provides a stipend of approximately $18,000 a year, tax-free. So for some people, it's a really good option that, wow, I'd really like to have Mrs. Smith, who I've known for 40, 50 years. I can take care of her. I'm not working. Mrs. Smith, come and live in my home. I will give you care. It works out great for some people. It's a very popular option, actually, for younger persons with disabilities. The last one is Senior Care Options, a SCO program, which is an insurance program for folks who are on Medicare and Medicaid. You can get home care through the SCO program. They will also provide you glasses, dental care, no co-payment for drugs, 
but again, it's Medicare and Medicaid, but another option in terms of insurance programs that can provide that well-rounded care that you need to stay at home. And lastly, I always like to say, you can get home-delivered meals. All you have to be is homebound. Home-delivered meals will provide you a nutritious meal five days a week, seven days a week. We have frozen meals. And I can attest, because we do taste testing once a year, that the Meals on Wheels are good. We provide feedback. This Meals on Wheels kind of has a bad rep. They're actually really good. And sometimes I look for an extra one in the fridge because they're really that good. So it's a great option if you want to stay at home. Again, somebody drops off that meal. They come in. They chat with you for a couple of minutes. You form a relationship. If you know someone who is older and would like to get home delivered meals, all you need to do is call Bay Path. We deliver here in the Northboro area. We de deliver in all of our communities around. So with that, I'm going to give this back to Arthur, and I'll be available for any specific questions afterwards. Thanks very much, Christine. Thank you, Arthur. So I bet you didn't know about all those, right? <laughs> so there were, there were a number of programs that uh, Christine's organization um, funds and pays for. I just want to make a couple of observations on some of the things that one of the things that Christine said. Remember she talked about one of their most important things that they can give you, and it's a free service, is the case management. The case management in these kinds of situations is just crucial because for anybody who has tried to figure this out, because you have somebody, you have a, you, you've been taking care of somebody or you're trying to figure it out on your own, even if you don't have memory care problems, it's really complicated because all of the various services that come from all the various agencies are spread all over the place. You just get lost. At least they used to be like the yellow pages, you know, now that's gone, you know. So unless you just really love Googling stuff, it, you can just get buried in this stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So l last week I got a call from a, from a lady who was really concerned because she li lives in South Row, it turns out in her own house, and her daughter, who had been regularly taking care of her, um, had, had moved. Um, and so now she was trying to figure out what to do. And she was a person, once again, in a house and, and has you know, some other means, you know, some money in the bank and stuff. But where do you start? I mean, as it happened, when I got to the house, the lady, the, her lady, the lady from, from, the, uh, from the Meals on Wheels program was delivering the meal. And so I actually talked to her for a second. Um, but other than that, she was like, you know, so where, how could I, how can I get food just to put in my, you know, in, in my refrigerator? How can I do any of this stuff? The case management is the key to that, right? And Baypath will actually provide a lot of those services, as Christine just mentioned. And those are services, the case management is free. The other services are just with a copay. And, as, and also, the other, the other thing I just wanted to mention about what Christine said, remember, be, be, we tend to think about these services o as only being available if you're really frail. Really frail, the traditional definition is that you need at least assistance with a couple of the activities of daily living. With, you, know, you need actually physical assistance with dressing or eating or bathing or toileting or getting around the house, right? But remember what Christine just said. If you need help with grocery shopping, you know, if you need help with, much, with cleaning the house, much more basic or, or, or kind of a much more expansive list of services, those services can be available to you. So those are just, that, that organization, I cannot say enough about Bay Path Elder Service. They're, they're just terrific. So how do you pay for these services? So other than the programs that Christine talked about, we're, we're back to where we were. There, were this, there is savings, there is Frank and Mary's savings. Um, there is the reverse mortgage that I talked to you about, or there is long-term care insurance. And so, I mentioned this last time um, for folks who are still healthy, and now I'm going to mention it again. By the way, I just, so I just talked to the broker. I'm 68, so I just talked to the broker last week um, because we're buying some. So the, the, the most important role of long-term care insurance, as I mentioned last week, is not to pay for nursing home care because you can usually make, have mass health pay for the nursing home care. The biggest role of the long-term care insurance is to help you pay for some of that care at home if you're married. If you're married, if you need a few hours of care, well, Christine has talked to you about that, but if you need more than that, right, 
then it may be that you're doing this combination and maybe your long-term care insurance is paying for some of it and maybe Baypath is paying for some of it. Because remember Christine mentioned that for those programs that are not asset-based, the number of hours that they can give you is more limited. So perhaps both of these programs put together can provide what Christine needs. The other issue, as Christine mentioned, is that one of the issues facing the entire Commonwealth is the limited number of caregivers. The limited number of caregivers. Now, and, and, and the programs that are funded through the state and that Baypath um, pays for um, have some, some caps regarding the amount that they can pay to the, to the caregivers. The long-term care insurance is a little more flexible in terms of how much they can pay to the caregivers. So it's, it's a really important option. So with regard to if you're paying yourself, either because you're using savings or because you're using money through your reverse mortgage or whatever, I just want you to be sure that you're aware of this. If the, the medical deduction for seniors, and you all know that you know, there's a medical deduction. You know, you do your taxes and you check it off and you can get a medical deduction. Uh, and, and as a result of changes that were done actually in the recent um, tax reform last year, the threshold, the amount uh, of income that you have to, or the, the, the amount of deduction you have to, ha of medical expense you have to have before you can start deducting it actually went down. It used to be that you couldn't deduct things until your deductions equaled at least 10% of your income. It went down to 7.5%. So it's, it's a handy deduction. Now, once again, you say to yourself, well, well how would that be relevant to, to these situations? Well, because medical deductions under a provision of the, of the Internal Revenue Code that most f folks don't, aren't aware of, and by the way, the, the Department of Revenue, Massachusetts follows this also, says that it includes, medical deductions include qualified long-term care services. What are they? They are services that are being provided to someone who has, needs substantial assistance. Not assistance all the time, not necessarily even every day, substantial assistance with two of the activities of daily living. Eating, transferring, toileting, bathing, dressing, continence. Or needs substantial supervision, not constantly, but substantial supervision for health or safety. Who decides whether you need that substantial assistance? Your doctor. Your doctor or, you, or a nurse or a social worker. Your social worker can make that decision. If they put that in writing, then all of the, the, the expenses that we were just talking about are medical expenses, which is really important if you're Frank and Mary's needs a lot of help and you're needing to use your IRA because otherwise you're saying, I don't want to ever touch my IRA. I have to pay taxes when I pull out that IRA money. Yeah, but if you're pulling the IRA money out in order to pay for these services, it's going to balance out. You're going to, you're going to get income from your IRA, but you're going to have this big medical deduction to, to, to balance it out. Or if you're selling the house, if there's a capital gain, you're balancing it out. So the, so the, the qualified long-term care services deduction can be like really, really handy for folks. Um, as Christine said, the Choices Program is the Frail Elder Waiver Program. When, when, whenever the state folks are talking about choices, or about Frail Elder Waiver, they, they call it that. In other states, they get to call it different things. The reason for that is that the, the Medicaid program, as opposed to Medicare, which is federally funded totally, and therefore there are one set of federal rules, the Medicaid program is a, a, a partnership between the states and the federal government. And so the rules vary by state, and so every state gets to name their own program. So we get to call it choices here. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about qualifying for that frail elder waiver, which Christine had mentioned is really crucial. So once again, I'm going to go back to this slide. Remember I told you what Frank and Mary's assets were. Uh, they have their house. They have a bank account. They, everything adds up to $950,000. Frank's income is $2,000 a month, $1,500 from pension or Social Security and $500 from pension. Mary's is half of Frank's. So in that situation, um, how does Mary qualify for the frail elder waiver if she wants to be staying home and getting these services? Now, as Christine says, said, she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank, and, and actually, Christine, these, this number just went up. Oh, this, it did, okay. Yeah, yeah, this just went up. So as a, as, as from, this is a new number. Frank can own the house. And actually, if Frank owns the house, there's no limit to the value of the house. It can be a house of any value. We use this program a lot regularly. Folks with, on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, you just, it, the houses are worth a million, all a million dollars, but everybody can qualify for this. 
The house can have unlimited uh, value. The other assets can be up to $123,600. And there's no income limit to what Frank can own. And as Christine pointed out to you, for purposes of the frail elder waiver, um, um, Mary's income is, is the only income that gets counted. There is a cap on Mary's income. It's fairly low, as, as, as um, Christine mentioned. But in this program, it doesn't make any difference how much Frank's income is. So in this situation, if Mary right now needed to qualify for the frail elder waiver, she could. Because the other thing to remember is there is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. It's one of those things that you never hear when you hear the ads about, oh, you've got to protect your assets and you've got to transfer your assets because there's a five year look back period. There's no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So if Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health in order that she can get the frail elder waiver, it's really simple. She's going to transfer all of her assets to Frank. Remember, she, Frank can own the house, doesn't make any difference what the value. Um, Frank is going to keep some of, his, some of that cash, but remember his total money, counting the IRA and the, uh, and the annuity and the cash, was more than the, the magic number, 123600 So say he'll keep $100,000, $100, and then he will go buy an annuity. The, now remember, Frank can have unlimited income. And as far as Mass Health is concerned, if Frank buys an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, and by the way, if Frank's 80, he's got a life expectancy of that point of maybe seven years, eight years, right? Um, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So if Frank, if all the assets get transferred to Frank. Frank then keeps $100,000, which is below the 123,006, and uses all the rest to buy an annuity. The day after he buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for the frail elder waiver, which, as Christine said, may give Mary, Mary as much as 24-7 care. Not right now, because we can't find the caregivers, right? But it's not a fault of the, pro the program. The money is there. It's just that we, we're, as a society, trying to train more caregivers because there's such a shortage in this area. So the only other thing that Frank would want to do in that case is Frank would want to change his will. Why? Because if Frank died, and, and, and remember the, the, Frank's earlier objective, Frank and Mary, they all said they want to live in the house until they die and they want to be buried in the backyard. And then if Frank dies, he wants to leave all of his assets to Mary and Mary to Frank and then to the kids. Well, if Frank leaves all of his assets to Mary, now all of a sudden, Mary's going to have assets of, of, of more than $2,000 and she's going to have a problem, right? So Frank would change his will. He would make the annuity that he purchased as short as possible. Remember, he has to buy an annuity that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy. And the reason why he wants to make that annuity short is that under a, a change to the Medicaid regs in Massachusetts that occurred last year, if Frank buys that annuity, Mary starts collecting on the frail elder waiver. Frank then dies, and some of the annuity payments haven't been paid to him yet, because remember they come to him over a term, a fixed term. The remaining payments, MassHealth will have a lien on. So the goal of the exercise, if Frank is buying this annuity, is to make sure that he gets all the money back, because once he's got it back, as long as he changed his will to make sure that following his death, his death things go in trust for Mary's benefit instead of going directly to Mary, if he then dies, once he has the money back, the money will be safe because it will be in trust for Mary's benefit. So Frank is going to want to buy a, 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 a short um, as an annuity as possible. And then his will is going to say that things will be in, held in trust for Mary. He could name his kids as the trustees. And then after Mary's death, things could just be distributed to the kids. And that way, the assets become uh, lien free uh, and non-countable. So that's the way this works. So I, oh, I guess I'm just going to mention one other thing. I'm going to go back to that. So um, of course, one question is, well, what if there is no Frank? What if Frank's dead and Mary has all of these assets and now Mary is trying to qualify for the frail elder waiver? And I'll just, I'll just mention to you that there are two things that Mary can actually do in order to qualify. Because remember, her, her problem is going to be that she has all of these assets. Um, first of all, her house is not going to be an impediment because she is, she is allowed to have the house through, on the, under the frail elder waiver as long as the value is, as Christine pointed out, less than $840,000. Her problem is going to be that other money. 
So she needs to do something with that other money. She could do one of two things with it. One, she could buy an annuity with it, the same kind of annuity that I just described. Now, the annuity would thereby increase her income, and it would subject her to a copay, but, it would, but, but as a result of doing this, she could qualify for the frail elder waiver. The other thing she could do with the money is put it into something called a D4C pooled trust. That's way too complicated for today's presentation, so I won't go into detail. <laughs> in, in brief summary, there are these, there are these uh, entities that are allowed under federal regulations to basically take your money and other money that they collect. They're nonprofits that operate for the, basis, for the purpose of, of helping elderly and disabled people. They take your money and pool it with everybody else's money. That's why they call it a pooled trust. And then they basically manage the money for you. They pay you, you know, you, they earn interest and they pay you, the, they charge you an interest fee. Um, but, and then that money, if you've given it to them, can be used over your lifetime to provide anything you need, to supplement your care in any way or to provide for any of your other expenses. So in Mary's case, if Mary took all of her cash, put it all into the D4C pool trust, the trust could pay for any supplementary care that she needed. It could pay for her mortgage if she had a mortgage. It could pay her taxes. It could pay any of Mary's costs. But because the money is there and not in her bank account, for mass health purposes, she has less than $2,000. And so she's allowed to qualify for mass health. That's kind of, I didn't did want to get into detail over that situation because it's more specific. So anyway. Um, if you found all of this interesting, but we talk too fast, and that doesn't apply to Christine, she doesn't talk too fast, but I do, then you can watch us again anytime on, the, uh, on, on, the, uh, our, on Frank and Mary's YouTube channel, Elder Law um, Frank and Mary. You can also see it on Northbrook Cable. Thank you very much to Northbrook Cable for coming today, for being willing to show these. Once again, the goal of all of this stuff is to give you peace of mind. That's the point of all of this. Um, it, it, we get to our age. I always tell my clients, fame and fortune is no longer relevant. The goal is can you get a good night's sleep. So if this is helping you figure all of that out, then that's great. Um, once again, both of us will be around later on for questions, or afterwards, for, or right now, and then afterwards for private questions if there's anybody that doesn't want to ask their question in public. Also, Christine and I will be doing presentations here. Chris has been kind enough to say that we could come back, mainly because he loves the fact we draw a crowd. He loves the fact we get a crowd. So it's like, oh, this is true. <laughs> Um, so we're going to do a couple this fall, one of them on the senior care options um, program that Christine just mentioned. It's a program that probably, how many, raise your hand if you've heard of senior care options. Yeah, that's, exa <laughs> that's exactly the issue. Mass, and, and Ma Medicare and Mass Health are really going to be wanting to push you towards senior care options in the near future. And if you are, is it, does it apply to them yet or is it just young people where, where basically if you're, if you're like qualifying, you, you, you are presumed to be on senior care options unless you opt out. Does, is that happening here yet? Um, is not happening. Not yet. happening here yet, but that's where it's going. So you really want to know about senior care options because it's going to affect all of your health care. Uh, and, and as I just, you're not alone in being, no one knows about it. It's just kind of happening. So we're going to do one on that, and then we'll do a second one to be determined. So thank you very much. Any questions for Christine or, or me? Yes, sir. I noticed throughout your, uh, Sheets that the word Medicaid is used almost exclusively. Does that exclude Medicare? Yes, yes. Everything that we've talked about was purely about Medicaid. Um, and one of the reasons why we focus on that is because the stuff that we're talking about, the, the benefits we're talking about, typically Medicare does not cover. Medicare is a health insurance program. And like all health insurance, it covers, for want of a better term, the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So, for example, it does not cover. Um, it only covers nursing home care if you've been sick, which they define as having spent three days hospitalized, and if you're going to get better, which they define as you're there for less than 100 days. So after 100 days, they don't pay for it. And then Medi Medicare will pay for, th for services at home, but only for so-called skilled care, nurses, physical therapists, you know, for all of the things that you really need, especially if you're married and you've got memory issues, Medicare doesn't cover it. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. Let's say you had long-term care insurance, so you were able to pay for some of the services that you needed to stay in your home. Can you still make use of they have services such as the case management? Yes, you can. Yes, that's one of the great, comp it's really complimentary. It's a great 
So for example, you know, as, as, as Christine mentioned, you, can get, you may get up to 24-7 care for, through the Frail Elder Waiver. It, it has been my experience, often it's less than that. Often it's up to maybe 40 hours, 50 hours, which is a lot, you know, but it's not, but there are, you know, there are, there's more hours than that in the week, right? So, so that, that, that provides a really good complement, the long-term care insurance does to that. And, and as long as, you just want to be careful about one thing. You want to make sure that on your long-term care insurance policy that it is not paying you a specific benefit if you are disabled, but rather is reimbursing you for services. Because if it's paying you, there are two different kinds of policies. If it's paying you the benefit, then for mass health purposes, that amount gets added to your income and typically, therefore, puts you way over as far as the deductible and stuff is concerned. If, on the other hand, it's reimbursing you for services, it's not added to income. So it's a really important distinction. Understand? See how that works? Any, any other questions? Chris? Am I allowed a question? Yes, you're allowed. Well, how old are you again? Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. This gets into the weeds a little bit, but, but say you want to remain in your home and you want to uh, retrofit your home so that you can age in place, and you want to hire Carol, and uh, do you pay Carol directly, or does the state pay Carol, or is it a reimbursement situation? I'm just curious. That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Carol, do you know through the home modification, does, does the bank pay you directly, or does the bank reimburse? The home modification, if you go through the home modification loan program, they pay you, you pay me. Okay. Um, some long term care insurance will also cover. Um, a renovation. It depends on the long-term care insurance. As long as you stay within the footprint, say if you, you need a new bathroom. If you stay within the footprint of your existing bathroom, they will pay up to a certain amount for that retrofit. You said long-term, you're not on speaker, so I said, you, yeah, you said long-term care yeah, insurance? You said, first of all, I just want to repeat that regarding the payments for, through the home modification program, that the payment comes to you, so you pay, you pay the contractor and then they repay. Or, they, or basically, it's a loan, because it's a loan, right? But you also said that you can get some a lot of these home through through a long term care some long term care insurance. You cover a remodel oh. of your home, depending if you stay within the footprint of that home. Yeah. And again, the client that I had that did that it was after the fact, so she came yeah. back to us for paperwork, but they paid ninety five percent of her bathroom remodel. Nice. I've never heard that. That's great. That's why. I got to keep shopping. I got to ask the lady I'm buying my long term care insurance for. Yeah, really. if, if I get that benefit. Any, any other questions? Yes, sir. You talked about, in most of the examples you gave, you talked about the husband and wife. What happens if you're single? If you are single, let me give you two minutes on if you're single. So if you're single, um, and I, I was alluding to this at the end of my presentation, and, and, and by the way, this doesn't apply to Chris. Christine was talking about once you're eligible, here are how the programs work. So of course, it, all of her stuff is there. Um, you, if you're single, you need to hit that number if you want to be dealing with any of the mass health related programs. And, there, and that is the frail elder waiver, the, the um, um, adult foster care, the so-called adult foster care program, and the PCA program, the personal care attendant program that Christine was talking about. All for, to qualify for any of those, you have to be mass health eligible, right? So to qualify, you have to show that you have less than $2,000 in countable assets. But as I mentioned, you can Restructure your, first of all, your home is not counted <coughs> as long as the, your equity is less than $840,000. Uh, second, you can restructure your assets. You can't give them away to anybody unless you get married. I always tell people that's another alternative, you know, <laughs> is, you know, if you want to get married, then you can give it all to the spouse. But if you don't want to do that, then, then, you, need, then you, you can either buy an annuity uh, and thereby turning your asset into an income stream and therefore getting your number below $2,000. Or you can transfer the money to a D4C pooled trust. And I'll say, I, so the, the short story about pooled trust I tried giving you, if you want to learn more about them, just Google pooled trust, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled trust. Or Google plan of Massachusetts. There are, five of, there are five pooled trust plans in Massachusetts. We use that one almost exclusively because it primarily covers this part of the state. And they're located in Dedham, I think. So that See, because once you use the pool trust, the pool trust will assign you a social worker to be working with you regarding what kinds of things you really need. And then they'll use your money. They'll give you your money back. Or they won't give you the money, but they'll buy all of that stuff for you, right? Um, and so we, it's handy to have someplace that's relatively close. So 
Google pool trusts. But no matter what you have, as I always tell people, you can always qualify for mass health. The question is whether it is worth any of the trade-offs that are involved. But you want to, you always have that option. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So with a pooled trust, could, could they not be able to reimburse you for what you put in? Or if you pass away before you do something, you I share what happens to the rest of it? I don't understand the question. Okay, let's say I have a million dollars. Yeah. And let's say I max somehow to put it in a pooled trust. Yeah. Uh, could the pooled trust run out of money? That's one thing. Could it go bankrupt? The question is, could the pool trust run out of money and go bankrupt? Well, all of these are regulated by the Attorney General's office, right? And they're filing annual statements and all of that stuff. So I suppose they could run out of money just like anybody could run out of money. But they are being supervised. These are not pretty much, you know, fly-by-nights. Um, the issue is, regarding those pool trusts, there is an application fee which is small. Uh, there is a, an annual investment fee, right? So if you gave them a million dollars, they would char typically they would charge you a point, 1%, to manage your money, which is basically what you'd pay your financial person to manage your money, so that's about the same. They do differ, though, at, in their end game, in that some will specify that, depending on how long you, they have been holding your money, when you die, they will keep a percentage of that money, right? Up to 15 to 20% if the money's been held for a long time. So if you have a million dollars, Right? then that, you may decide, is too much a price to pay in order to get all of these other benefits. If you only have $100,000 or $200,000, then that, that percentage may be much smaller. I'll also mention that one of the, the advantage of traveling, I just went to the National Elder Lawyers Association convention in New Orleans with my wife, and that wasn't so bad, and, 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 and that's how I justified the trip. But while I was there, learned, uh, of a, another pool trust that is actually operates out of uh, Pennsylvania and that does not charge any, uh, any of these fees at the end. Uh, so we're actually going to be using those, them, because we do a lot of this kind of work. We're actually using them to test to see if it all works, if they are what they say they are, but it all appears to be good. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm surprised that you, you at 68 are looking at long-term health insurance. Uh, why didn't you buy it when you were younger, and what is the last age you would consider buying? So the first question is, why didn't I buy the long-term care insurance when I was younger? Well, some would, my wife would say because I was stupid. Uh, I would like to think that, <laughs> um, you know, there, there is, there, let me put it this way, there is an age at which you stop doing the life insurance and you start doing the long-term care insurance, right? And, and this is where finding is the point at which this is the switch that is occurring, right? The, long, the life insurance is not as relevant now, right, as the long-term care insurance. As to when, when the end is, when, when the last day is you can apply, there really isn't one, although it's harder to apply after 70. And that's why we're, I'm applying right now, right? It's harder, but, it, but it is, it, it, you have to jump through more hoops. And of course, if you have dementia, you're not gonna qualify, you know. There, is some, there are some other diseases which are predictors of of dementia, because that's really what the program is supporting. You know, certainly it supports some folks that have physical disabilities, but mostly it's folks who have memory loss, who have, you know, Alzheimer's or other diseases that cause dementia. Okay, so don't assume that you don't qualify just because you're over 70. And it's, and, you know, it's worth, it's like the reverse mortgage stuff. Don't, don't just, dis, it's like going to see Baypath. There are some things that you should just do as an older person, you know, and an older person, I, that used to be a really offensive term, but now it's like half the country, right? So it's, it's all of us, you know. It, there, you should talk to Baypath ahead of time, you know. If you're interested in assisted li if you're if you're getting older, you should go see some assisted livings. So that if it turns out that you've got a major problem, you have a fall, blah, 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 you can't live at home anymore, now you're not just saying, oh, where can I go? You know, because you kind of say, well, you know, it's not home, but this wouldn't be so bad, you know. The long-term care insurance you should look at. The reverse mortgage you should look at, just so that you kind of understand your options before it's a crisis, before it's a crisis. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am, sorry. If you're uh, considering long-term care insurance, uh, where do you start looking? Do you talk to BayPath, a BayPath counselor? Do you talk to a lawyer or some a financial planner or what? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I should, unfortunately, you are dealing with insurance people. I, that's a, I shouldn't say that. that so you, know, you just have to look around. I don't think Baypath could help you with that. You know, we have some folks that we recommend, although we're not affiliated with them. I always tell them, you know, we don't get a cut. You know, you know, it's just we have folks that we've dealt with that we found our clients have been very satisfied with them, right? But it's really just a matter of shopping because the plans are all over the place. And the premium prices are all over the place. It's, it's very non-standardized. And some of them will even fix your bathroom for you. I want that one, right? I had, I had never heard about that. So you really need to sh shop it, okay? Yes, ma'am. How, re how regulated by the state are the long-term care insurance companies? And, and as a corollary to the question, do you have adult children coming to you and telling you that the insurance companies are throwing obstacles in the way of their parents collecting on these funds? So A, how regulated are, are the insurance companies in terms of, especially in terms of making sure that they've got enough money to pay you, that they're not just spending? The answer to that is very, but, but I was going to say, getting to the second question, a lot, a lot. I have a lot of people, not a majority of folks with long-term care insurance, but a lot of people who have said that it has been challenging sometimes to both get the long-term care insurance benefits started, right, and to get things paid for. And in those cases, what I typically recommend that people do, right, is they'll say, oh, you should really do this. You're the lawyer. That's a very, ex I'm a very expensive tool to be trying to deal with this stuff. And I don't know health stuff. The best people I have found to deal with that are geriatric care managers, people whose business it is. They, typically, they were social workers or nurses in their previous lives, in their current lives, but they decided that what they wanted to do for a living was do case management to help people figure out what they need when they're seniors, right? The private sector version of those case managers that BayPath has. It has been my experience that those folks are also great advocates in these kinds of programs because they can be advocating from a medical perspective, right? Because they know what the charts say and what you really need and they can talk to the nurses and doctors and all that stuff, just as general advice, okay? Uh, yes, sir, and I think this last question. Yes, sir. Uh, for a person over 65 yeah. on Medicare, yeah. uh, doctor orders tests, co-pays seem to be going up significantly from what they were before. Uh, is there any support that could be provided for a senior for these large co-pays? The question is, is there any support that can be provided for a senior for large Medicare co-pays? And I guess the only answer I can give you is MassHealth. If, if you were on MassHealth, MassHealth pays the co-pays. I can't give you another, I, I, the only other thing I can say is join the club. I have the, I get the same problem. Uh, other qu anyway, thank you very much for coming. Thank, please, can I have a round of applause for my one, Christine Alessandro? You gotta go see Baypath. <laughs> Have a great summer, we'll see you in the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you.